It's the Tony Kennett Cast on 93 WIBC. You know, my friends, you might find this hard to believe, but there are a lot of people out there who just think that the food that appears on your grocery store shelves and in the produce aisle comes from nowhere. That it just pops up out of the ground with no human hand or design or chemicals or work and labor that has to go into it. There is a war on farmers and farming going on, not just here in the United States and in Indiana, but around the world. Now, I don't got to tell you the importance of farming to Indiana. You know, we're talking about 11 million acres that were used for harvest in 2022 alone. We're talking about a state of 4 million hogs, 189,000 dairy cows, 94,000 individual farmers, and an industry that contributes at least $35 billion to Indiana's economy. And that was just a few years ago. Farmers are important. And it turns out that way of life is going to have to be protected. There was a wonderful segment that appeared on Fox and Friends a couple of days ago featuring agriculture writer and policy analyst at the Consumer Choice Center, Bill Wirtz, talking a little bit about the war on farmers in the EU, namely Germany, where the Germans have been standing up and standing beside their farmers uh, to help them defend their way of life and the flow of food from farms to all their people. Bill, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you so much for having me, Stephen. Yeah, it's very nice to talk to you. So uh, give us the rundown. What has happened in Germany that has pushed tractors and farmers and all sorts of agricultural vehicles out into blocking the streets and protesting the German government? Um, It's been interesting to watch. Yeah, well over 30,000 of them in Berlin uh, just last week. And the trigger for this protest essentially was the an increase on taxes for diesel and an additional tax on tractors. It's all the agricultural vehicles that farmers need. And the farmers had negotiated with the government previously and said, this is just not viable. Even if we had a good harvest in, in, in 2023, that will mean that doesn't mean that this will be replicated in the future. And we need to stand on solid financial ground. And they are taking to the streets now very much alike to what we've seen in the Netherlands, where farmers got active against new uh, environmental regulation. And they said, we want this stopped. And uh, it's made quite the waves. It's made quite the waves all over Germany. Now, why would the German government come out and bet against their own farmers in the way that they have here uh, by making it uh, more expensive for them to do business? I mean, we are talking about a sector that is already being ravaged by all kinds of regulations on pesticides, on things that protect you know, crop yields. Uh, and then they're coming after their ability to, to do business and actually collect the crops with their, their vehicles. It, it seems vindictive. It, 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 it does. And, and so the reason is twofold. I mean, on the one hand, the German government currently has a hole in the budget that it needs to needs to fill of about $18 billion. And these taxes would raise about $1 billion. Uh, so, so there's a fiscal reason here, uh, on the one hand, to, to raise more revenue. And on the other hand, it's an environmental agenda. Because if you reduce the amount of uh, farm production that happens in your country and you import from abroad, then on paper, it looks like you you, you, you did good environmental policy. Um, and, 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 and sort of this, this all comes together. And what you mentioned earlier is absolutely true. So the, the, the regulatory burden on farmers has really increased over the last few years and decades. I mean, running a farm right now, I mean, you, you, you basically need an accountant or two accountants to even run it properly because there's, a, there's, there's massive books of regulatory compliance that you need to do. And very often, that's probably not why you got into farming in the first place. Maybe you took over the family business. Maybe you were just passionate about the, the work. Mm-hmm. But then you get confronted with all these regulations, both from the European Union side and the German government, and it's made farming so burdensome uh, for those who work in it. Bill, I don't understand. Still, I, I know that the environmental agenda exists. I know there are ideologues who care a lot about lowering emissions, but I, I don't understand how even well-meaning people could come after farmers who we all know are not exactly living in in luxury out in, in the plains and, and working on our behalf to, to feed us and give us fresh food. 
why these people? Why are we turning all of our attention on the most fundamental part of a civilization, which is our ability to produce our own food? So the the problem for a lot of the people on the environmentalist side is that the farmers didn't take their side. So the environmentalists have said for years that big businesses, big companies are the are to blame for uh, for, for climate change, and you know they're just enriching themselves and they're making these pesticides, but we don't really need them. Also, they make a make us sick and all of these things, even though that is just not scientifically proven. And they they assume the farmers were going to be on their side. And the farmers have come out and said, no, I mean, we wouldn't spray our crops with something that we think will poison people. So we have a lot of data that says it doesn't. So no, I mean, if anything, I guess we're on the side of business then, even though that's a weird framing. And so the environmentalists have now also turned against farmers and by saying, oh, the farmers are complicit in the bad health of people uh, and, and the enrichment of those large corporations. So, so essentially, farmers have also become the target. target. When, you, when you read sort of the, the blog post by environmentalist organizations, they name farmers in the same sentences as they name big uh, agrochemical corporations. Yeah, like green, yeah. Greenpeace, right? Greenpeace does that too, yeah. So, so, so Greenpeace came out, for instance, against the German farmers and said, "Ah, oh, they're just making a fuss about nothing. They should just buy electric tractors, and it would solve the entire problem." Which is ah, yes, because those are so affordable, and electricity in Germany uh, isn't uh, sky high compared to the rest of Europe. It's a absolute absolute joke. Um, look, I, you told me a little bit about this was this was growing and that this was expanding beyond the borders of Germany. Are these things? picking up in, in France as well, the protests? Yeah, so in southern France, there's, uh, there's small protests already, and the, the president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, is now concerned uh, over these protests and is trying to nominate someone for the European elections that might be you know, more accepted by the farmers, because he was initially banking on uh, nominating an environmentalist to, to swoop up the votes on the left. But that might actually now be a bad idea. So we see a political shift where a lot of politicians in Europe are finding out that if you stand against a farmer, you lose politically. And so this this has really had repercussions that when farmers organize, they actually do have a voice politically. Well, I hope Hoosiers are listening. Uh, when you organize against a farmer and farmers, you're, you're probably going to lose. Uh, what's the lesson here for Americans? You know, we're talking about middle America here. We're talking about people who produce and live around and, and surrounded by farms uh, all throughout these lands. Uh, what's the lesson for Americans? Because I, I don't see politicians in the states, particularly in the 2024 election, talking about farms at all. So it's very it's very rare for presidential debates to pick up this topic at all. And even though it's so major, and 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 also the fact that the even though the president doesn't make specific legislation regarding farming, the president does appoint uh, directors of agencies that make significant changes on, for instance, everything from the availability of pesticides to the way you are supposed to farm uh, in, in in general. So so this has ramifications, and nobody's asking those questions, including in states in the US where farming is a major contributor to the economy. So this has always been very puzzling to me why those questions are not being asked when they are so vital for the sector. I mean, nobody pretends that farming is easy. Farming has always been hard. There's bad harvest, there's, there's, there's changing conditions uh, uh, in, in weather and climate, and, and farmers need to deal with those. The least we can do for them is not make their profession harder by over-regulating them. Well, they've already been doing this in, in New York, have they not? I mean, Governor Kathy Hochul in New York, uh, she just signed a bill, was like, I don't know, Save the Birds and Bees Act, something that sounds completely benign and unobjectionable, uh, but it's going to actually crack the whip on pesticides in the state of New York. And again, just making it harder for people to produce uh, crops to feed people. And, and the crazy thing is, if, if Governor Hochul had just you know Googled this for a few seconds, she would have found out that the French government did the exact same ban and then had to abandon the ban because most of the sugar beet farmers would have gone bankrupt in 2020 because they had so many parasites that they couldn't fight anymore with those insecticides that had just been banned. So the French government had to walk back uh, some of these rules that she is now trying to implement. What a joke. It's not like we made pesticides for fun, people. We made them so we could protect our food and produce more for more people. Uh, Bill Wirtz from the Consumer Choice Center, thank you so much for coming on and, and explaining this. Um, I will be following your career with great interest, sir. 
Thank you, Stephen. All right. We're calling it in early tonight for the IU game. Hope you enjoy and stay tuned in for that. But that is it for the Tony Kennett cast this week on 93 WIBC. I've been Stephen Kent filling in for the wise and powerful Tony Kennett, who will be returning to you next week. It has been a pleasure being with you all. I don't think this is the last you've heard from me. We'll see you again soon. And until then, stay free.